And this is just some of what he's put out on his social media page. And I've had a guy call into my radio show this week and say, you know, Jesus said that they are of the synagogue of Satan. So um, I, don't, I don't think Jesus is a big fan of the Jewish state and the Jewish people. Uh, I think he turned on them. They rejected him and he turned on them. He's done with them. Uh, you know, this is what people are trying to say. Can you set this straight here for us and, and show why this scripture should not be used to promote anti-Semitism? Well, you know, as the old saying goes, a, t a text without a context is nothing but a, a proof text to support someone's, you know, preconceived religious system. Um, anybody can quote the Bible. The devil quoted the Bible to Jesus out of context in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. Anybody can string Bible verses together to support anything really they want to prove if they don't care about the context, you know, G, uh, Judas went out and hung himself, you know, go thou and do likewise, and what you do, do quickly. So I just supported <laughs> suicide, the uh, out-of-context verses. So when you look at these verses that Stu Peters is quoting, John 8, verse 44, and that tweet, for example, you are of your father, the devil, all you have to do is back up to verses 13 and 14, and you see who Jesus is talking to. Uh, John, it's in John 8. John is known for its sort of long conversations. That's one of the outstanding or unique characteristics of the book. There's a long conversation there in John 8, and if you go back to verse 13, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are talking to Jesus. Verse 14, he's answering them. He's answering first century Israel's religious leadership. That's who he said, the, the people that were plotting to kill him. Oh, he so was he wasn't speaking. talking to, he was not talking to the entire Jewish people ever to have been born or ever to be born. And he wasn't speaking to the Jews uh, of the world today or the Jews that make up the nation of Israel today. Correct. Yeah. And what, what Stu Peters does, he takes that one case where Jesus is upset with that group. And he tries to make it sound like that's a blanket statement for Israel past, present, and future, which is a, just an abuse of the Bible. And then when they run over to Revelation 2, verse 9, and Revelation 3, verse 9, the synagogue of Satan, well, there's a context there. Jesus is speaking to the seven churches of Asia Minor. One of them is named Smyrna. Another one is named Philadelphia. And apparently near that church was a synagogue that was persecuting those churches in Turkey. You know, for uh, today we call it Turkey, back then Asia Minor. And that's who the Lord says is a synagogue of Satan. It's not um, a blanket statement of Israel at large, you know, or Israel as a whole. Let me just give you an example. It would be like taking Christ's statement to Peter in Matthew 16, 20 through 23, where Jesus says concerning Peter, you know, get behind me, Satan. Now, when Jesus made that statement to Peter, he was talking about how Peter was acting right then and there. Uh, because remember, it was Peter that sought to talk Jesus out of the cross. And so when Peter made that statement, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. He's not making a blanket statement of Peter's future. Because all you have to do is keep reading, and you see that Peter was restored, uh, John 21, after he denied the Lord three times. And as you move into the book of Acts, the first ten chapters, there's no more dominant uh, a character in the early church than the Apostle Peter. So what Stu Peters is doing is he's confusing a statement of discipline at that moment with an eradication of sonship. Uh, Israel is God's firstborn son. You'll see that in Exodus 4, verse 22. Israel is the only nation in the history of the world that has a covenant, not from Israel to God, but from God to Israel. And that is an unconditional covenant, Genesis 15, verse 18. And when that covenant was entered into with the ritual of passing through the animal pieces, which was a common way of entering into contracts or covenants uh, in the time of Abraham, 
Abram was asleep. God intentionally put Abram to sleep, and God alone is represented by the oven and the torch passed through those animal pieces. And that's why God says through the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 15 through 17, that as long as the sun, moon, and the stars are in existence, you know, Israel will always be a nation before me. So the truth of the matter is you cannot cut Israel out of God's future program because they have an unconditional covenant. Now, that doesn't mean God can't send discipline or through the various prophets, as you read the Old Testament, you know, register his displeasure with them at any moment. But that's not the same thing as cutting them out of God's program entirely. So what Stu Peters and all, you know, Chuck Baldwin does this, Rick Wiles, you know, with this mindless repetition of synagogue of Satan is they find some isolated passage where God is displeased with Israel at that moment, and they make it sound like God is through with the Jew. And that's just a, uh, you know, if you did this in law, for example, you rip things out of context like that, you would be, you would probably be disbarred. But for some reason in the area of Bible interpretation, it's okay, it's okay to do this. Well, um, from where I sit, it's not okay because God himself says if you add or subtract the very last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, I think it's verses 18 and 19. If you start adding or subtracting to what God says, God is going to add to you the curses that are in the book, and he's going to take away your place from the tree of life. And so there is a very stern warning about doing this kind of thing. And James 3, verse 1, you know, it says, let few of you presume to be teachers, knowing the teacher will incur the stricter judgment. And here's Stu Peters with this, I would think, a fairly large Twitter following, spewing this nonsense, you know, violating every normal principle of Bible study and Bible interpretation in the process, you know, misleading people. And, you know, he he really ought to be ashamed, ashamed of himself. And if I were him, I wouldn't be... I before God, I wouldn't want to be in his position. Mm-hmm. Why doesn't he, or any of these people that are so, you know, and some people say, well, I'm not, I'm not an anti-Semite. I'm anti-Zionism. I'm not anti-Semitism. I'm anti-Zionism. Is there really a distinction? It's a, I've heard this for a long time. They call this the, you know, the new anti-Semitism. Um, you know, it's okay to be anti-Zionist as long as you're not anti-Semitic elsewhere. What what a ludicrous (laughs) distinction. Uh, Zionism is the belief that Israel, after the Holocaust, had nowhere else to go. Every nation that she's been pushed into in what's called the diaspora, the worldwide dispersion, going all the way back to when they were evicted from their land in AD 70, everywhere they went, they've been persecuted. They've had sort of a reprieve here in the United States, thanks to something George Washington said to the Toro Synagogue in Newport, uh, Newport, Rhode Island, back in 1790. But other than that, every country they've been pushed into, they've been persecuted. And the reason that we are Zionists and believe Israel has a right to that land and we support their right to return, and we think they're there legally, by the way, and they're there because God put them there, is because every Welsh everywhere else they've gone, they've been persecuted. So how can someone be um, an anti-Zionist and not simultaneously be anti-Semitic when you're denying Israel the only safe place she has on planet Earth? Well, that's very true. And why do none of these people, why do none of them want to quote, let's see here, Ezekiel chapter 37. Uh, I will make, verse 22, I will make them one nation in the land and on the mountains of Israel. There will be one king over all of them, and they will never again be two nations or be divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols. Okay, so right there he's acknowledging they did this. They'll no longer defile them with their idols or vile images or with any of their other offenses. Okay, no, I mean, God's saying, well, I know they've, they've done some things they shouldn't be doing. This is why I scattered them all over the world in judgment. But I'm going to bring them back. For I will save them from their sinful backsliding. I will cleanse them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. My servant David will be king over them, and and they will have one shepherd. They will all have one shepherd. 
They will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. They will live in the land I gave to my servant, servant Jacob, the land where your ancestors lived. They and their children and their children's children will live there forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers, and I will put my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Then the nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy when my sanctuary is among them forever. Couldn't I mean, how much clearer could it be that God has a remarkable plan for them? He hasn't forgotten them. He's redeeming them even now. He will redeem them, and he will dwell among them, and they will be his God. So do we still want to keep trashing and, and <laughs> defiling them when God is saying, I'm going to redeem them? I mean, I, these people that do this clearly don't either believe the Bible or understand the Bible. But, you know, it's so frustrating yeah. because it's so it's 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 evil. It's absolutely evil what some of these people are saying. Yeah, and, you know, since we're quoting uh, Bible verses, um, here's Romans 11, 28 and 29. Uh, Paul writes, in relation to the gospel, they, that's the Jewish people, are enemies on your account. Now, he says that there because the Jews were persecuting the early church. You read about all of that in the book of Acts. But Paul goes on and says, but in relation to God's choice, they are beloved on account of the fathers, that would be the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whom God entered into that unconditional covenant that we spoke of earlier. And then Romans 11, verse 29 says, for the gifts and the calling of God are irre irrevocable, meaning they can't be withdrawn. So that's how you look at the Jewish people. You don't demand a, a perfect standard. Um, what you do is you say, well, you know, God isn't finished with them yet he's at work in their lives and by the way brandon uh here's a trick question for you guess what you have to be before you can become a believer an unbeliever <laughs> to be an unbeliever uh, you know you know i can work? go back into the life of some of these people and i can find reports on them and that some of them are not very complimentary but why would i want to go back and dig up someone's past if they're living a clean life now, a good life now, maybe some of them become Christians now, why would I ever want to go back and talk about what someone else had done in the past? And even if they weren't saved, let's say they have a pretty tough past, but they're living a honorable life now and they have a family and they work hard and they've really cleaned their life up. Why would I ever want to trash on them? Because I would hope that I would see them come to Christ. And if I, as a Christian, trash on them, because of their past to somehow get you know dirt on them or be vile against them why would i want to do that 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 doesn't endure them to christians and it's not right to do it's not fair to do i i get you know i don't understand why some of these people who who i see doing this i'm like wait a minute you haven't always done what was right you've had some issues but we don't go around using that to condemn you because that's not the right way to to conduct oneself why can the jews why can the gentiles i mean we've all got past right and you're and, and and God's not even hiding it. You guys were vile. You worship idols, but I'm going to redeem you and I'm going to dwell among you. I mean, here's the other question I have: How many of them know anything about the Belfar Declaration? What was that around 1917, or the Sam Re the Sam Remo Conference that took place uh, in about 1920? I mean, which which was the international community saying that area of land belongs to the Jews. That because they're like, well, Israel didn't come around till 1948. So the the Israel of 1948 clearly is not the Israel of the Bible. Well, the government that was formed in 1948, you know, that's different. The people and the land still there, and the international community in 1917, Belfar Declaration, 1920, the Sam San Remo Conference, they they all said that's the land of the Jews. True or false? Uh, it's true. And whether you're talking about Jacques Peters, Canadian lawyer. Uh, who wrote his 20-year doc, doctoral dissertation on the topic, by the way, or whether you're talking about Joan Peters and her classic work, you know, from time immemorial. Um, here's, the, here's the bottom line. And by the way, I bet you Stu Peters has never heard of the San Remo Conference or the Belfar Declaration. I mean, he has a, no clue what we're talking about here. But all of a sudden, he's an expert yeah. on Israel. 
Yeah. Well, World War One, you know, we can put it this way: World War One, post World War One, prepared the land for the people legally. In what you're talking about, uh, Bellflower, San Remo, League of Nations, etc. World War Two prepared the people for the land because post Holocaust they figured out we're not safe anywhere. And those two world wars did more than any, more than anything else. They created a legal and a desire for Zionism, you know, to come into existence. But here's the conclusion of Jacques Goudier, Joan Peters, um, looking at League of Nations or United Nations Partition 1947. Um, you can say whatever you want about the Jewish people. Say whatever you want. But here's the one thing you cannot say. You cannot say that Israel right now is doing anything illegal. 